Mr. Herbert Hoover says that now's the time to buy. So let's have another cup of coffee and let's have another piece of pie. I just played um, a tune by Irving Berlin, Let's Have Another Cup of Coffee, which I first heard when I was in the fifth grade back in Beaverton, Oregon at Vos School. Uh, Miss Hosford, my fifth grade teacher, she had this library of records and um, she, she had this, this uh, LP with music from the 1920s and 30s. And so let's have another cup of coffee was there. And of course it was written, you know, tenor of the times, um, the great depression had hit. This is before FDR and the 100 days when uh, Herbert Hoover was in charge. Um, yeah. Can everyone hear me? Just say yes, if you can type it into the chat box. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, that's it for music. <laughs> but if you could hear it, it sort of touches upon um, where the country is in 1931, 1932. Of course, FDR comes on in 1933. So let's talk about perseverance. Um, and of course, this year's theme for the Archives Crawl is preserving perseverance. Um, you can take a plumb line. It's one of my favorite metaphors. You can take a plumb line throughout Sacramento history and the histories of many other uh, cities in the US and just drop it right through post-European contact. And you can see that, that folks have struggled, um, citizens have struggled finding housing, um, finding relief, um, finding comfort in their lives. You can start with squatters' rights of 1850. Um, of course, what we're gonna talk about today, the Great Depression and the Hoovervilles or Rose Roosevelt Roos is another term. And then where we are today with the challenge of housing Sacramento County's um, unhoused citizens. So, so this is a point in time. And I think one that's really, um, important to revisit and hopefully a bit of a, a teaching moment um, for all of us. And also as archivists, I know one of my colleagues is out there, Heather, we, we all understand the importance of context um, in doing what we do. Okay, so let's get going. Uh, Capital Hooverville, Sacramento's Depression Era settlements. Um, Basically, we look at the 20s and 30s, two major traumas in American history. Um, we, we have the contagion that is the Great Depression. Okay, so we have Black Tuesday in October 1929 unleashes this, this great contagion of um, economic stress throughout the country. Um, one third of American banks close um, and depression. We also have the ecological uh, tumult uh, created by the Dust Bowl, right? Um, the origins of which go all the way back to prior to World War I, actually, but really come to a head um, in the late 1920s and early 1930s. So um, with these things happening, Americans almost naturally as we look at the different migrations in American history, are compelled to move to a spot of perceived um, opportunity, perceived being the operative word here. Um, and so that in many cases is California um, and more specifically, at least in our case, Sacramento. So, uh, when we look at the micro level and we look at really the center of today's talk, it is the Hoovervilles and the Hoovervilles specifically in what's known as the Jaboom Street uh, section um, of Sacramento. So that's everything um, north 
of the SP rail yards, the B Street levee, and south of what would become um, North Sacramento, which, you know, by the mid-1920s was a fully incorporated city, right? So that was known as no man's land. I can't give you much on the etymology other than it probably has something to do with World War I, okay? Because it was really um, an interwar period name that, that popped up. So what is a Hooverville? Um, most of us know what a Hooverville is. We're all historians here. You may not, might've snuck on by. Um, my definition of a Hooverville, simply a depression era assemblage of ad hoc community, community being really important, uh, launched in response to economic and ecological stress. And who knew that Sacramento could be such a spot where Hoovervilles were so prevalent? But anyway, let's jump in. Now, as we move through the talk, we are going to start with the basics, OK? And the first thing is, who were the folks that moved into Sacramento's Hoovervilles? Now, the backbone of my talk, uh, full disclosure, is a wonderful document uh, that I discovered at the California State Archives. Um, it is a survey that was put together in 1935-1936 by SARA, uh, the State Emergency Relief Administration. Um, this agency, almost like a, a mini um, National Recovery Administration, uh, sent out 30 of its employees to the Jaboom Street area to do a survey and learn about the folks that chose to live in Jaboom Street. And so it's through this survey that we get this amazing window into the lives of Americans um, and also immigrants living in that area. So this is really sort of a common thread through, through today's talks. A lot of the statistics, some of the anecdotes come from that survey. Now, where is the survey? Like I said, one, it's at the State Archives, but we also have a copy here in the Sacramento room if you do want to take a look at it. So, slight diversion. Um, who were these folks? So, according to the survey, as of August 1936, 82.7% of these folks arrived in the Jabo to the Jaboom Street area between 1920 and 1932. Um, so we have folks arriving well before the Great Depression and then folks arriving, you know, after it and during it for sure. The bulk of the folks arriving we're from an area known as the Middle West. It's a term we don't use or hear too much anymore. We, we often hear Midwest, which refers to, um, you know, uh, states around the Great Lakes um, bordering the Great Plains. But the Middle West identifies basically the Great Plains from North Dakota all the way down to Texas and then Nebraska over to Utah. Um, so that's where a lot of these folks came from according to the survey. Um, also the states of Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, but simply put, obviously folks were coming to Sacramento's Hoovervilles from all over the country. Um, one tale in particular that we're gonna tackle later um, involves a family from Johnson City, Tennessee. That is far east Tennessee in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina. So from all over the country, folks come. And this picture right here uh, was taken by Dorothea Lang. We've probably heard that name before. Um, this young man is 14 years old. He's an eighth grader. And he's living in the uh, garden land uh, Hoovervilles um, in the American township, um, just on the other side of the Jaboom Street Bridge. Um, he is not in school, um, according to the caption by Lang. He's not in school. 
He is surviving on tomatoes. Um, these are the only clothes that he has. His father in the caption is quoted as saying, people call me a bum, but what bum can raise a child all the way up into the eighth grade? Um, so this, is, this tale of this young man is very similar to the tales of a lot of children um, that we're gonna talk about this later, but a lot of children living in the Jaboom Street area um, of Sacramento. So, uh, where they're from, who they are, we'll learn a little bit more about them as we go through uh, today's talk. Okay, so more basics. So migration causes, we look to land use. So again, the Middle West, we look at the, the Dust Bowl. Basically, um, when we have the uh, population of the Middle West in the late 19th century, early 20th century, we have too many people for too many land. We also have aggressive uh, farming techniques that are destroying um, the topsoil, this black primeval, beautiful topsoil of the Great Plains and the, the beautiful uh, grasses um, that are romanticized through much of the, the 19th century um, in the Great Plains. Um, so this fetters farming, right? in food production. We also have drought. We have these low level jet streams that come from both the Pacific Ocean and Atlantic Ocean. And for whatever reason, um, it's debilitated during the 30s. And so we have a drop in pre precipitation throughout the entire country, but in particular in the Midwest. So with the sort of uh, surfacing of dust um, combined with the lack of rain, we have, we have dust. Um, we have dust in the air. And two words for you, uh, dust pneumonia, um, one of the most heartbreaking maladies um, that America went through in the 1920s and 30s. Um, that is really well covered um, in the book, um, the worst hard time, which we'll address a little bit later on. Also automation. Um, we turn to the great Kevin Starr for information on this. So between 1920 and 1932, um, uh, tractor sales go up by 90% in the entire country. Um, World War I has just ended. Of course, we look to wars for great scientific breakthroughs that bleed over into civilian life. And of course, you know, we have the development of the tank, um, and then we have the improvement of tractors, and we have the heavy, heavy mechanization of, of agriculture uh, in the United States. And so what we find is uh, fields that would basically take 100 people to go ahead and tend uh, could now be dealt with by one guy on a tractor that you could pay a buck 24 to for a day, um, thus releasing those 100 people. You just don't need them anymore. And so people are basically, as Star puts it, tractored out um, and made to move somewhere else, right? And then general economic malaise. Like I said, we have a third of banks closing between 1929 and 1932. In Sacramento in particular, we have a population of roughly 100,000 um, and our unemployment rate is about 28%. So things are very, very hard, um, both in Sacramento and of course around the country. So these are the factors causing this Western migration. Okay. And what are the causes of the Great Depression? Um, I, I get nervous when it comes to, <laughs> to economics and talking about um, you know, the, these causes. There are so many different ways of looking at it. Underproduction, um, increasing interest rates, the lack of foreign trade. Um, but I'm just gonna direct you to Am Amity Schley's The Forgotten Man which is a very, very fair, even treatment of the Great Depression. Um, she doesn't look at FDR as some messiah. She doesn't look at uh, Herbert Hoover as some bogeyman. Um, she's just very, very fair. And she will also provide both a Keynesian and classical liberal 
um, view of these causes of the Great Depression. So this book, of course, is at your library. You can also get your hands on it or your ears on it uh, through Hoopla and Overdrive. So I recommend it. It is quite good and quite fair. All right. So more basics. Why California? Why California? Well, obviously, it's weather. Um, that's the first thing. Um, it's been the clarion call to Americans, um, you know, si since the mid 19th century. Um, Mediterranean climate, very kind to agricultural production um, and agribusiness. Um, and then also California is in the Sunshine Belt, um, very moderate weather. Um, you know, there's a reason why uh, California has the greatest number of uh, military facilities in the entire country, in particular um, Air Force and Air Marine facilities in the entire country. The weather is really, really good here. Um, again, agricultural opportunity. Um, and then it's the place of last resort. Again, I invoke um, Kevin Starr, you know, he uses the term land's end, um, a lot like the, the Britons being pushed to the end of Cornwall um, by um, the invading Danes in England. So land's end. And Steinbeck writes about California, obviously so eloquently. Um, he uses the term westering um, in the Red Pony, which came out in the mid-1940s, westering, which is this the spirit of Western movement. And if things aren't going right where you are, you can always go to California. And of course, for some people this worked out, for others, um, it was very sobering that things didn't get any better. Okay, so why California? We move to why Sacramento? And um, when we look at Sacramento, we look at our centralized position, right, within the state. We also look at ourselves as a hub of transportation. So going all the way back to CP and SP, um, we are a rail hub. We also have connections to Sacramento Northern, the electric railway, um, Western Pacific, and then also somewhat newer Southern Pacific, uh, excuse me, Southern Sac Sacramento Southern Railway, sorry. Um, and then also um, ground travel, right? So we've got um, a highway hub here, and then also water travel um, with the Sacramento River and travel, of course, between the Bay Area and Sacramento. Perfect size, and I think this is something that is um, applicable to today. Sacramento is big enough to have city, county, and state agencies that provide services to citizens and citizens that need help and citizens that are homeless, but it's not so big that you can't head out to um, the far banks of the American River, set up your tent and get rest um, and spend the night and then come back into the city during the day for both um, work and then whatever services you can find. And then there's also the presence of agri employment. Despite the fact that the New Deal uh, created the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which was an idea whereby um, farmers would be paid, subsidized by the federal government to produce less. The idea would be to create greater demand and raise prices for um, agri-goods, um, which with that, why would you need more people? There were still opportunities for employment in agriculture in California at the time, um, whether that be um, asparagus in the Delta. I mean, by this time, uh, the Delta was producing something like 90% of the nation's um, supply of asparagus or celery, ick, uh, in, in Natomas uh, was, was being grown. And of course, tomatoes. Um, so um, that's why Sacramento. All right. So let's get to Hoovervilles and let's get to a map. Now, what I'm going to do really quickly, let's see if I can do this. I should have tested this beforehand. But what I want to do 
if I can, I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment because what I want to do for y'all is make sure that you get a really important map. Um, and the map is for the Jaboom Street Hoovervilles. All right. So with that map, you all can follow along, right? Um, with this whole thing. And there we go. And so you can kind of know where everything is. Now, you should be able to see my cursor, right? My, my arrow here with my mouse. And basically at this time, um, within the Sacramento area, we're looking at we're looking at four primary Hooverville districts. Now we're gonna be focused on, Shab on Jaboom Street, which is right here and also includes Y Street, which today would basically be Miller Park. Now the other Hooverville districts in the Sacramento area are gonna be right up here. Gardenland and then Broderick right over here and then down in the Delta, all right? But we're gonna be much more interested in taking a look at Jaboom Street. And it's within the Jaboom Street area that we have roughly 539 households and roughly about 800 people um, seeking shelter in roughly 1935, 1936, okay? And within that area, we have what are known as Jaboom Street, okay, which is the namesake for the larger area. We have Shooksville, which is right over here, number seven. We have, oh, wait, no, seven is, oh, sorry, seven's the city incinerator, which abuts Shooksville, which is very important. And then we also have Lewis's camp, which never made, made, it, made, up, made its way, excuse me, into the survey because it came around at around 1937, 1938. And then we have Rattlesnake right over here. And then we have Rotten Egg, which are basically between 25th Street and 20th Street um, along the SP, uh, SP trussle. Um, along the American River, okay? So hopefully everybody has that map and you can have it open as we go along because it's gonna give you some really nice context. And by the way, the map um, was hand-drawn for that Sarah survey. Um, it's beautiful, really. And we've got a nice key up here with scale and everything. So, so keep it, hold on to it. Um, it's really, really quite good. Okay. So let's talk about the Hoovervilles and let's take a look at um, Jaboom Street, which was the largest of um, the Hoovervilles in Sacramento. And as you look at this picture, you'll see a couple of things that might be familiar to you, or actually maybe just one thing. Right here, obviously, <laughs> we know maybe what this is. This is the PG&E power station. Um, which has a long history. It's in rehabilitation mode today, right? Because it's being rehabbed, parts of it um, being rehabbed into a museum. But we can see right here, we have Jaboom Street. And today, if we were to superimpose Jaboom Street into this section today, we would have I-5 basically running right through it, right? So um, very, very populous at this time. You can see the levee line right over here. Demographically, Jaboom Street is mixed race, okay? So a predominance of white Americans, but also African Americans, Latinx, Asians, and Pacific Islanders, and also Native Americans living in this area. Um, one interesting bit out of the survey, uh, 
one of the surveyors states, they seem to ignore the difference in color and mingle freely on equal footing, which I find interesting. Um, it, it makes me think of um, the labor theory of value. There was a professor up at Portland State, uh, David Johnson, he's emeritus at Portland State. And he came up with this concept, the labor theory of value, where in the American West, going all the way back to the mid 19th century, um, it was extremely easy to die. Um, and what really mattered more than a medical degree or a law degree um, was, your, was your ability to survive in these extreme conditions in the American West um, and the ability to get along with other people who were smart and could help you to survive. Um, and so he applies this to the gold rush and the early development of the American West um, as kind of a democratizer. Um, so the labor theory of value, but this is Jaboom Street and it's a really amazing photograph. We used it in the book that we did on World War II as kind of a look at Sacramento just on the eve of the second great war. Okay, and this, this is another shot of um, Jaboom Street, Hooverville, and this looks up toward the American River. So this tree line right up here is the American River. And I'll let you guess for a second or two what bridge this is right here. That's the Jaboom Street Bridge. And of course, today we have I-5 just busting on through right over here and then off to the side we have the early early makings of Richards Boulevard and then of course Burkett Richards Cannery is going to be off to the side right here but this is a terrific picture from the National Archives and Records Administration. Okay and by the way folks I may pause here and there um, I am also the producer and I've got to let folks in so I'm glad folks are still joining us welcome if you're just dropping in Okay, and then this is also another look um, of the Jaboom Street Hooverville looking south um, toward the city. And of course you can see the levee right there as well. And you can see again, the ad hoc nature of these living structures um, that folks are getting by on. Okay, now let's pivot and talk a little bit about Shooksville. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, this is uh, number seven, if you will. This is the incinerator, um, which is still around today, right? Um, it's at uh, 7th Street and B Street. Um, the incinerator was built in roughly 1925. It was part of that massive rush of um, public works in the city of Sacramento. Really, uh, uh, spurred on by Clyde Seavey, um, really the city's first city manager, um, to improve the lives of Sacramento. And so we have the city incinerator coming in, we have the water filtration plant coming in, uh, Memorial Auditorium, um, and so many public schools being built in the city. But the city incinerator, there it is in by the mid 19 or by the late 1920s, it is incinerating some 100 tons of waste from the city every single day. And out of that chimney, out of that smokestack, we have all sorts of really yucky stuff falling on the city and falling primarily on the people that would be living around the city incinerator. And that would be the city, the Hooverville city, of Shooksville. Shooksville is named for a fellow named Samuel Shooks, um, known as the mayor of Shooksville, an African-American who had been living in Sacramento since the 1920s, and he was the leader. Um, demographically, Shooksville was a primarily minority um, uh, populated uh, Hooverville, and um, probably uh, the Hooverville that, Hooverville that was in the worst shape um, 
out of all of the living conditions. Certainly when you compare it to garden land on the other side of the American in Jaboom Street, um, the toughest living came in Shooksville. Now, Samuel Shooks, kind of a character, um, took a look through the Sacramento Bee, and I found a really interesting ad um, from 1931, February 1931, Mr. Shooks puts an ad. He says, one winged duck priced $25, a natural curiosity. You can come claim your duck at 7th and North B Streets. So think about where you are at North B Streets today. And if you're looking north at that intersection, just take take a right, head east, and Shooksville is, is basically right there. Um, here's another picture of roughly where Shooksville would be. Um, I pulled an interesting uh, little, little editorial or letter to the editor out of the Sacramento Bee. Um, it was sent in in 1933 by a a traveling businessman named A.E. Silva, a resident of Sacramento. But um, it's a little long, but I think it gives you kind of a flavor of what one would experience if you were going to go by Shooksville at that time. And the headline for the entry is Kind Kindness of Black War Veteran Cited. Editor of the Bee, Sir, my work takes me hither and yon to the slums and the mansions as well. The other day, it was my pleasure to work in the jungles. And by the way, that term jungles is used to describe the area north of SP, north of the B Street Levee in Sacramento. So uh, it was my pleasure to work in the jungles of the city incinerator, right? So near Shooksville. As I approached a, a shack made of tin cans, dry goods, goods boxes, and God knows what else, I saw a black man busily uh, engaged with a large fan. As I neared his shack with the morning's greeting, I noticed the fan was working overtime over a little child, keeping away the bothersome flies. A little questioning, and I soon found that this poor man himself, a disabled war veteran, has taken it upon himself to be the keeper of a poor little 19-month-old orphaned Mexican girl, both parents dead, and both her eyes blind with cataracts. Nothing to me is ever clutched at my heartstrings as this scene. What love there is in that poor veteran's heart to care for this poor little orphan child, nothing to him, not even of his own kind. To me, there is a true heart. God bless him and his poor little blind charge. And that's from A.E. Silva, like I said, that traveling businessman, Sacramento, June, so it's warming up in Sacramento, 1933. So a very humanizing window, uh, into what's going on in Shooksville at that time. Okay, so that's Shooksville. And let's pivot over to Lewis's camp. So Lewis's camp uh, sort of postdates the Jaboom Street uh, survey, but existed within what, have been, what would have been uh, Jaboom Street at that time. So Lewis's camp is right off the B Street Levy. This is B Street down in front of us, but just to the east of um, Shooksville. And this photo, um, my best guess would be uh, taken from just above the levee, right, of B Street. So you're on the B Street levee, just right along the, the SP right away, and you're looking north down upon Lewis's camp. Um, so that's where you're taking your photo. So the namesake for Lewis's camp, Lewis Scavelli uh, came to Sacramento, an immigrant from Italy, 
Um, he lived in North Sacramento, but he owned land um, that, that Lewis's camp uh, occupied. Um, he ran a small grocery store and also drew rents, very, very minimal rent from the residents of, of that area um, called Lewis's camp. It's also important to mention that what makes Lewis's camp unique is that, like I said, founded in 1937, 1938, it wasn't closed down until 1952, which I find remarkable actually. Um, so, you know, it made its way all the way through World War II and up until the end of the Korean War before it was raised by the city fire department, um, displacing about 400 Sacramentans um, from Lewis's camp. Okay, so, all right, and this is another shot. Um, this photo was taken by Dorothea Lang. Um, again, she's elevated, right? So she's looking at B Street, she's looking north, and that's the entry point to Lewis's camp. Now, um, this perspective, I think, is amazing. This is a 1937 aerial photograph. Now, if you haven't discovered it yet, I want to encourage you all to take a look at the UC Santa Barbara aerial photograph library, which is accessible online. Most of these images have been scanned and you can download them. Um, and they come from, again, UC Santa Barbara. Um, no need to write down this URL. I'm gonna um, shoot out to you all a, uh, um, the URL and uh, a reading list um, of helpful readings to better understand the Great Depression the New Deal and Hoovervilles, but um, it gives you a really interesting look and some context for the Jaboom Street area. So over on this side, you can actually see what would have been Jaboom Street. Um, but by 1937, Jaboom Street as a, a village, if you will, within the general Jaboom Street colony was gone. Um, the water filtration plant is right over here. Obviously, here's the river. Here's the power station right over here, I-5 eventually, right? Busts its way right on through. Over here is Shooksville. And then right over here is what? That is the incinerator. This is B Street right over here. And then right here, you can see Lewis's camp. And of course, Lewis's camp in 1937 is still a thing, right? So we've got, you can actually make out structures at Lewis's camp. And then right over here, we have 12th Street, the bend into 12th Street, SP, and just the edges right over here of the wonderful neighborhood of Alkali Flat. Okay, so that's a, just an amazing aerial view. And by the way, if you're a resident of Sacramento and you want to get just a really enhanced view of, um, you know, your neighborhood and its historic, um, you know, personality throughout time, take a look at the aerial uh, photography database at UC Santa Barbara. It will blow your mind, simply put. Okay. Now, again, we look to UC Santa Barbara and the Gauchos for a, another view of uh, two Hoovervilles within the um, Jaboom Street uh, colony. And they are, and again, let me give you some context here. We've got 12th Street right here, okay? And then we've got 16th Street right here. We have the SP right away, okay? And then we've got today what will generally be known as Sutter's Landing, but right on this edge, this is roughly 20th Street, we have an area known as Rattlesnake. And Rattlesnake Hooverville, which is a wonderful name, is made up only of men, and most of whom are criminals, according to the survey, and ex-cons. Um, so 
they all live together. Um, the area, the, the village is known for its ability to come together as a community and build furniture for sale. Um, and it's also known for, according to the survey, its ability to divide labor as a way to sustain itself. Okay, so that's Rattlesnake. If we move a little bit further here to the east, we end up at 25th Street, okay, in an area known as Rotten Egg. Now, Rotten Egg barely fits into Sacramento city limits. So you actually have to get permission from the city of Sacramento to live in Rotten Egg. But Rotten Egg is made up of mostly veterans and also men only. So no, no vet, or excuse me, no families living in Rotten Egg, um, just like Rattlesnake. And the main source of revenue for Rotten Egg are walnuts and black walnuts, which are cracked open and then pulverized to make walnut meat, which would then be sold to confectionaries in the Sacramento area. The biggies at this time are going to be Martha Washington, um, which would have been on J Street, Upper J Street, and then also the Sutter Confectionary on K Street um, would have been uh, a place to go at the time. So that's Rattlesnake and, and Rotten Egg. Um, and two spots that by 1935, um, roughly would be gone. Okay, so those that's kind of a snapshot of the Hoovervilles within the Jaboon Street colony at that time. Um, let's turn at this point to just looking at some general statistics at that time. What, what about um, demographics? So basically uh, 80 percent of the residents those 500 or so households, 800 people living in Jaboom Street, 80% will be white, 16.3% uh, are going to be Latinx, 2.7% will be African American, and then less, less than 1% will be Asian, uh, Native American, Pacific Islander. Um, again, I mentioned garden land um, is roughly 95%. Uh, white. Now, in terms of citizenship, 75% of residents of Jaboom Street are um, American citizens, either natural born or naturalized. 25% are immigrants, most of which are Europeans. Okay. Um, now, as we look right here at kind of a textbook structure, and my guess is that this is up against uh, the levee on the other side, you're going to have the, the Sacramento River. So this puts us in Jaboom Street. Um, let's look at material types. And when you think of material types, think of the industrial presence um, in Sacramento at this time. Uh, you have box make, making factories. Um, you've got uh, Setzer down on Fifth Street and Y, or what today is Broadway. Um, you also have uh, the California Packing Company. You've got Burkett Richards. So a lot of packing materials, right? So you've got boxing. You also have scrap metal um, from SP. So if you're resourceful and, um, you know, you want to find a, you know, uh, raw material, right, to build your structure, you're going to team up with your community to find what you can. Um, and so when we look at a structure like this, we can, we can look to our survey to also tell us that material types, 52.1% of structures um, in Jaboom Street are comprised of tin, 41.2% use wood, uh, and 6.7% of structures use canvas. Um, to make a home uh, and, and do the best with what you can at that time. Next topic is a topic um, near and dear to my heart and that involves veterans. Um, 
roughly 20% of those inhabiting um, the Jaboom Street colony um, and 20% of those 800 people in the area um, claim disability. Now, um, in 1935, 1936, that puts us about 15 years out from the First World War. Of course, we have Americans who've come back and they've been uh, haggard by either gas attacks and what those have done to their lungs. They've also been affected by um, the advent of high explosive shells, which had such a devastating effect during the Great War. And then there's also the hidden malady uh, hidden to many of us and those at the time living in Sacramento or throughout the country of shell shock, right? So one statistic that sort of pops out at me when you look at um, the nation in general, um, when it comes to military hospitals in the United States, three out of every five beds during the interwar period are occupied by service members without physical injury. So what does that tell you? It tells you that people are bringing to the Great Depression and to just their daily lives, um, the demons of war, the bugbears of war are still, still with them. Um, so definitely a factor um, at this time when we look at Jaboom Street and any Hooverville um, in the country. Okay, so more general statistics at this time. Um, what about water supply? We know that 72% of those claiming residence within the Jaboom Street colonies live within 100 yards of some water supply. And obviously the big ones at that time are going to be both the Sacramento or the American River. Of course, we're gonna turn, turn to the American River at that time being less affected by um, runoff and agriculture. Um, so if you're gonna get drinking water or if you're going to do laundry, that is where you're going to do your thing. And of course it behooves you to boil your water if you can from either river. 98% uh, of structures um, in the Jaboom Street colonies have no toilets. Uh, for the entire Jaboom Street uh, colony, uh, there are only eight outhouses as of the 1935-1936 survey for citizens. All right. This picture is taken by Dorothea Lang. And um, this is over in the garden land, Hooverville. So we move out of Jamoon Street. We're on the other side of the American. Um, and speaking roughly about the Hoovervilles, uh, 539 of those households, only 15 have electricity and only three have running water. These aren't shocking statistics, of course. But again, uh, gives you an idea of the lack of plenty that folks are dealing with at the time. Another shot um, taken by Lang from the levee on the American River, or on the north side of the American River, looking north to toward Garden Land. Um, how do, how do people make do at the time? Obviously, there are a number of different ways that people can make through, make do with work at the canneries, whatever work they can pick up um, at SP. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier um, the resourcefulness of folks who will go ahead and basically spend their day cracking walnuts. What will a day of cracking walnuts yield you? Well, according to the survey, 29 cents at the end of that day. One veteran of um, the First World War uh, would work 24 hours a week within a produce stand. Um, his payment at the end of that day would be pork butts, um, cracked eggs, um, whatever produce might be around, cheese rinds, um, and that would be his payment to get himself through the day, to get himself through the week um, within the Hoovervilles. 
Um, also, you know, I mentioned earlier um, the prevalence of boxes, right? So we have fruit crates that are being rehabbed and resold by folks living in the Hoovervilles at that time. Whatever one can do to make things work. And then, of course, what about children at that time? Um, life in Hoovervilles for children is devastating, absolutely devastating. Of course, there's the lack of socialization. There's massive malnutrition. Um, children, like the children you see before you in this picture within Jaboom Street Village, of course, you can see the PG&E power station there. Um, to play as a child, you need food. You need food for energy. Um, they don't get any of this. Um, there is a lack of clothing. There is a lack of school, therefore a lack of socialization. For the children that do find school, one anecdote from the survey uh, mentions children in Gardenland going to North Sacramento schools um, for classwork and before school and after school digging through garbage cans for food, anything they can to find food. Um, so a devastating time for children living in uh, Hoovervilles. And of course, the great irony um, with this picture is that if we look behind, we know that that structure is being rehabbed um, today um, into a children's museum, right? So um, just an amazing photograph. Okay, and then as we hit 1935, this is kind of the death knell for the Jaboom Street Hoovervilles. We have massive flooding. Um, basically water stands from one foot all the way up to five feet in the spring of 1935. The county of Sacramento uh, steps in, uh, uh, executive, county executive Charles Detterding and uh, district attorney um, Otis Babcock, um, they invoke uh, section 370 of the penal code. Um, to basically raise all the Hoovervilles in Jaboom Street, um, basically anyone or anything that gets in the way of public health um, needs to be removed. And so based on that code, they jump in. Um, now, this is privately owned land, um, which is important to say, um, owned by Merchants Bank over on California Street. Um, and then a woman named Edwina Funt, who was living in San Francisco, the last thing these entities wanted to do was to remove folks um, from their land, but they also didn't want to break the law. And so the county stepped in, um, Sarah, and then also the federal government offered to build new structures in that area. Detterding turned down the money because he was afraid that it would just enable folks not to work. Um, so the Hoovervilles were raised soon thereafter. What then stepped in was the Sacramento Community Chest, um, which founded in 1922 was basically community-based philanthropy. Um, they were able to offer hundreds of families uh, homes within the Sacramento, Sacramento area. So that is, is generally the demise of Jaboom Street, but, but the colonies, um, you know, sort of endured, you know, like I had mentioned, there is Skunk Hollow, um, there is Lewis's camp, there's also Russell's camp that lived on. This is an aerial photo, kind of a new acquisition in the Sacramento room. We could see the confluence right down here of the American River to the Sacramento River. This is where Jaboom Street would have been. So this is June 1941. And by that time, Jaboom Street is gone. Shooksville, you really can't make out um, the incinerator from here. You can see the water filtration plant. But Shooksville is gone as well. Um, and so many of the Hoovervilles are gone. Um, simply put, by this time, uh, uh, the New Deal is in full, full swing. 
1935, the Works Progress Administration has arrived in Sacramento, um, providing jobs. Um, you know, we have those big old, you know, overhead water tanks at uh, um, Alhambra and J down at UC Davis, and then over at Sacramento Junior College slash City College that are still here today. We have Grant Union Call. Grant Union High School, we have McClatchy High School. Um, we have any number of structures that are basically funded by the WPA and in turn putting to work hundreds of thousands of Sacramentans. Um, probably one of the more obscure jobs, what was known as the Bell Avenue job, which was uh, an artery that went from McClellan uh, or the Sacramento Air Depot to the government uh, docks on the Sacramento River. So it was this artery that uh, the Army Air Corps would move large planes that were having been procured and repaired at the Sacramento Air Depot were pushed along this avenue down to the docks and then floated down the Sacramento River to Alameda and then beyond. So a lot of different things um, uh, are created by the WPA and changing the course of history, of course, in, in Sacramento. So um, that reading list, right? That reading list. Um, so here are titles that I suggest. At the end of the talk, I'm going to go ahead and push these out to you. So don't, please don't write anything down. But um, again, the Sacramento Depression Settlement Survey, which you'll find at either the Sacramento Room or um, the State Archives. Kevin Starr's absolutely amazing uh, Endangered, Endangered Dreams, part of the California Dreams series. Just incredible. Um, really a great window into California and Sacramento at the time. Um, again, Amity Schley's The Forgotten Man, uh, Eric Rauchway's Why the New Deal Matters. This is really, really new. Um, again, a really uh, even treatment of the New Deal um, and definitely worth picking up. Um, uh, easy to get through the library, both in hard copy and then also in, um, in sound. Um, also, Tim Egan's The Worst Hard Time. Just a riveting, riveting book. I recommend it to you without any reservation. It is really the standard on um, the Dust Bowl. And um, the two things that uh, jump out at me are the impacts on public health of the Dust Bowl and then also the creation of the um, Soil Conservation Service, um, which helped really turn the tide um, with the Dust Bowl. And then Hooverville's Depression Settlements in Sacramento, a product of our own Golden Notes and the Sacramento Historical Society. And then also the great Jim Henley, um, really the great uh, uh, historian of Sacramento, along with Joe McGowan uh, and Bill Berg, uh, homeless in history and inside look at Sacramento's Depression era transient population. Definitely worth a look. And then a massive shout out to this great piece of historical fiction recently written by Shelley Blanton Stroud called Copy Boy. Copy Boy um, is about a young Sacramentan named Jane. Her family moves out to Sacramento from the panhandle of Texas um, to escape the Dust Bowl. Read this book, understand her life, or understand more Northern California during the Great Depression. Just wonderfully researched wonderful storyteller is Shelley, who is, I think, still a professor of writing at um, Sac State. But um, like I said, well worth your time and a wonderful insight into the life of a teenager in the Jaboom Street area um, during the Great Depression. And I'm not going to let you go yet because I've got another interesting story. So these three wonderful people right here um, answered a question. So big, big question being asked by history. And together, 
they provided an answer. So the fellow on the far left is a guy named Joe Manning. Joe, um, longtime historian based in Massachusetts. Uh, Joe Manning uh, is probably best known for all the writing that he did um, and research that he did in connection to um, the Lewis Hine collection. Lewis Hine was a photographer who documented the lives of uh, hundreds of children who were, who were affected by labor um, from 1908 to 1924. Uh, Joe Manning discovered this, this collection, this massive historical um, um, uh, groundswell uh, of content. And what he did with that is he was captivated and tried to learn more about the children that were captured um, in these photographs and interviewed ancestors um, and tried to tell their stories as best he could. So he had a, a natural predisposition for seeing a photo and being drawn to it. But he saw a photo in 2008 that Dorothea Lang had taken of a woman. He contacted the person in the middle right here. This is Dixie Reed, longtime writer for the Sacramento Bee, who's now um, a senior writer at Sacramento State and a friend of the Sacramento Room. Um, she wrote a story in 2014 on this photograph. And then this freelance writer right here, this is Tori uh, Masucci Cullens, who um, caught wind of the photograph and reached out to Joe. You're probably interested in what the photograph looks like, right? So let's take a look. That's the photo. That is, to me, forget migrant mother that Dorothea Lang took. This, to me, is a photo that almost brings me to tears when I look at it. Um, young Ruby is, we know, is what we know her name is. Um, within the caption that Lang provided, um, we know that Ruby, um, according to Lang, uh, was with her family from Tennessee. Uh, her father was a coal miner and they settled in the garden land section of, of uh, the Hoovervilles. Um, and uh, sorry, distracted by, by messages uh, to both of you who put something in the chat, yes and yes. Um, so Ruby was with her family over in Gardenland um, and came out from Tennessee, Johnson City, Tennessee. So that's in the just in the thick of the, the Appalachians. Um, things got bad, family moved west. And so Tori, we'll go back here if we can. Tori simply used a library resource, right? And she looked in ancestry.com. And based on uh, the census, found that there was a ruby based in 19... 40 um, in the Gardenland area, American Township. And that person was named Ruby Shepherd. Uh, she also found that Ruby's name was clustered. And here's Ruby's name, Ruby Nell Shepherd. Wow. Clustered with a family called Garland from Johnson City, Tennessee. Right. So all you got to do is look, right? And, and Tori definitely did. She immediately reached out to Joe and they got together and just kept hunting and hunting and hunting. And much to their joy and surprise, they found that Ruby stayed in Sacramento. And by the way, Ruby's surname, Shepherd, um, was acquired in marriage. She was abandoned after marriage. Her husband went back to Michigan. Um, she is a Garland by birth, um, but became a shepherd. Um, she got a divorce after her, her husband left. Now, this is the garden land area, and this is where Ruby would have been living at the time. Okay. Um, and of course, right down here, 
we've got the Jaboom Street Bridge and a very, very different looking uh, river district, right? Which is what we call it today. And I have no words. I don't need to provide any words. This is Ruby. It's really beautiful. So she stayed in Sacramento. Um, and these, these pictures were populated into ancestry by family members um, that had stayed in Sacramento and the Sacramento area. Um, so Ruby eventually went to work for the telephone company. Uh, throughout the war, she eventually met the love of her life, a gentleman named Robert Pearsall, who um, had been living in Sebastopol. Um, they both moved to uh, Sonoma County, uh, lived there for a while. Eventually, they moved back to the Sacramento area in Placerville. Um, sadly, Ruby died in the early 1970s, a victim of uh, breast cancer, but uh, she lived a good life and she found love and she found happiness um, post uh, the Great Depression. Um, so kind of a human interest touch, which I think is always important to bring to these larger, sometimes really traumatic topics um, that we have to bring up to better understand history. So Ruby Pearsall, and she is buried in, um, in Placerville. Okay, so to close things out, here's a view um, from the B Street Levee, right? The historic B Street Levee. I took this picture in 2009 for a book that I and Tom Tully wrote on Alkali Flat. Um, and this is from the B Street Levee looking south toward what today is a very different looking rail yard district. But even then you could see that Sacramentans had um, found that it was necessary to, um, you know, utilize different structures and utilize that land, um, no man's land, right, um, to find a place to live. Um, so probably clicked a little too early, but to have some thought about where we are, like I said, we follow that plumb line through history. Um, between 2013 and 2019, there's been a 55% increase in the number of um, unhoused citizens in the Sacramento area. Now, if we compare statistically 1930 or 1940 to where we are today, 1.7% of um, the population in 1930, 1940 would have been those living in Hoovervilles, and that's the county population. If we look at the county population today, 0.03% um, is made up of those that are unhoused living in Sacramento County. That's either unincorporated sections, incorporated sections, or, or Sacramento. Of course, compared to the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, we have neither of those issues to worry about today. So um, that number is well within a vacuum, that 0.03%, because at this point, um, we're without, obviously, the major, major impacts of climate change just, let, just yet, or some great economic malady, but who knows um, the way things are going with um, the debt limit and then um, what's going on in Congress. So um, I hope you've enjoyed today's talk. Um, I do want to recognize, um, again, Joe Manning, Dixie Reed, Tori Masucci uh, Cummins, and then the wife of Joe Manning, um, who I was in contact with a few days ago. Sadly, Joe passed away in April of this year, but a huge contribution that he made to our understanding of, of history, and especially through the eyes of those who lived it through photography. So with that said, um, this is where I work. Um, this is the Sacramento room. In fact, I'm, I'm right here. I'm right behind this little partition right here, folks. 
um, do come in and visit me. This is my contact information. We are open to the public. So we're open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday from one to six, we're open today. We are closed on Sunday, Monday, and Friday. Um, my name is James Scott. I am an archivist slash librarian. Um, this is my contact information, um, and I work a Tuesday through Saturday schedule. So if you write me on Sunday, hang in there, I'll get back to you on Tuesday. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I really appreciate everybody joining me today. Um, for Anne, who jumped in a little bit later, um, I am recording this. Give me a few days to edit it. And what I'll do is go ahead and post it both on the Sacramento Public Library YouTube page, but also on the SAC History uh, History Group. If you want to go ahead and send me an email, Anne, I can send you the link privately. Okay, so with that said, um, I can do my best to answer any questions that folks have, or, you know, even if you have comments. Um, so with that, feel free to take your mute off if you want to just talk, 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 or if you want to shoot something into the chat, you can do that too. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the Sacramento Archives Crawl. Um, we wish it were brick and mortar and in person. Um, but uh, we'll do it next year. Also, really quickly, let me go ahead and share with you, like I said I was going to do. I'm going to share with you my reading lists. Um, let me see, I should have been more organized with this, but further readings, okay? For those of you who didn't get the map, because the map is just so awesome, um, I'm gonna give you the map. There's the map. Um, so take a look at those because those are gonna give you a little bit more insight um, into what's there. And no one's gonna say anything. So I just wanna say thank you everybody unless you've got questions. No questions. Okay, so thank you James very much. Um, again, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, thanks all for coming. Um, do know that if you take a walk down B Street today, um, things aren't too different. Um, if you walk down 7th Street today, if you walk, you know, over on 16th, we're we're still facing this challenge. So, so thanks everybody for joining me. Um, enjoy the rest of the Sacramento Archives crawl and go Giants, go Giants. Okay, see everybody, thanks a lot. Mr. Herbert Hoover says that now's the time to buy. So let's have another cup of coffee and let's have another piece of pie.